developing a model of the car. And it was a puzzle that I knew I could do one part of that puzzle. Many things I wasn't sure about, but I thought, well, at least I can do that part. I'll start with this. But I mean, a Formula One racing car is so intricate and there are so many different details. I mean, how do you create a machine that makes drivers believe they're actually hurtling around a racing track when in fact they're they're sitting inside this, this simulator. It took us a long time. This is not a, something that came from one day to the next. We, we were following the development of a number of things, like um, the visuals, for example. You, you draw the computer graphics of a track and it looks nodding. And the drivers would come along and, you know, my computer game at home was much better. better. Exactly, <laughs> much better than this. Oh, and we, I had so many derogatory comments from drivers non non-stop because if they didn't like it you knew it you knew it from day one and, and the graphics was probably the first thing because it's so obvious mm. but luckily for us computer games really took off and graphics card and projection system we knew that if we wait another year it'll be much better so we'll concentrate it on other things but but the motion system was was interesting that's that, man, that's a completely different matter isn't it you can have the most tried road car simulators that had been built and they were big um like a big bubble in which they put a car in and they would move it on a on a hexapod and for a formula one car it's so not good enough because they're very very stiff formula one car is not built for comfort so drivers endure a lot of vibrations but the stiffness means that if something happens in the road you feel it all and if they don't feel it it felt so wrong and and having any delay so if you have hydraulics in the in the actuators there's a delay and that delayed drivers felt it was not good so we we came back from this road trip knowing what was important you know number one was when you say driving by the seat of your pants it's absolutely that it was vibrations really really important and then the steering wheel needed to be exactly right and not delayed and the pedal pressure needed to be right and the other one we really wanted to have was some idea of sustained G but we couldn't give that you see that, that that's my favorite part of it <laughs> I know that you know the G forces are important that just accelerating and braking you have up to the three G's on that but it's these the, the G force they feel when they go around the bends they're hitting the bends so fast it's a sort of let it, I'd pass out, I suspect. <laughs> Six Gs and more. Yeah. yeah, it's not as much as when you're in a fighter pilot jet, but it is high and you're changing Gs more often. That's the thing. It's really, really demanding on the body to the point where drivers, you see them at the beginning of the season, often their, their necks are really tired at the end of a race. They can't even hold their head straight because it's so hard on the, on the head. So what we ended up developing, but not at first, but a bit later on, was a helmet loader. Because your perception of motion lives in your brain, having something on your head that actually gives a constant force, that means a fraction of what you feel, but having that, you can fool the brain into thinking you have a constant acceleration. I'm not saying it's perfect, but the through driving, and I'd say normally within an hour or two, drivers will learn to drive our simulator, and some of them had motion sickness but everyone managed to drive it so it's a and we also found that chocolate was a good one every time every time a driver said mm, not feeling too good we gave them a bit of chocolate get them to walk around and it's amazing how these things just <laughs> make you forget a little bit that you're feeling a bit queasy dealing with being a grown people it must be dealing with little kids you know yeah. <laughs> i mean uh, so you've got the visuals as, as well as you can the sensation the g-forces did you have to put in the sound effects? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we, the cheering crowd, the roaring engines. Not, not quite the cheering crowd, but the <laughs> engines. <laughs> because an engine, and put it all together, and then just depending on what frequencies we're going. But it's it evolved into something a little bit more sophisticated. But wind, for example, is is a big thing because it's an open cockpit. So all of that needs to feel about right. And for years, work. I mean, I I would go home and go to bed and I'd, I'd just hear uh, uh, the engine going because you spend your day doing this it's, it goes anchored in you, you, you by just listen to the engine you know where a car is on a track I mean, you just get because it, there's a sequence like music there's a sequence so it, it absolutely is very important in all of those sensory factors so we spend so much time on all those little details I know David Coulthard was, uh, was a McLaren driver at the time you were working on the simulator did he did, the racing team. For one year on Pablo Montoya, 
and when he drove the first lap in Turkey, we had built it in the sim beforehand, so he came, his first lap out on the Friday, he was 10 seconds quicker than everyone else, and he, he came down to the radio and he said, it's like the simulator, and he just drove it fast from day one, he won that race. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And 10 seconds, I mean, you know, the, <laughs> normally in Formula One is the thousands of a second sometimes. Exactly. That so. It just means a brand new track, they go slowly first time and then they go faster and faster. He's done it on the same. He's done it in the same. So he, he got himself more comfortable with it. He probably did more setup work. And as a result, he, he managed to win the race. And I know it's, you know, one incident. I remember being really, really pleased at that stage. Yes, the, your simulator really does help. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like it. You know, they complain about it. It. It's interesting that you start off by building it to, with the driver's part of the experience to help you design a better car. You start to use it to actually improve the driver's own performances. Exactly. And if we hadn't done it that way, I think the drivers probably wouldn't have or have taken a lot longer to come on board. Well, after 10 years working for the racing team at McLaren, you then moved over to this other arm of the company, the McLaren Applied Technology. Why did you feel that was the right time to move on from F1? Well, it is a, a number of things. Firstly, the, the sim was starting to be very well used, and then I had two children, and so I had two maternity leaves back to back, and I wanted to work maybe um, a little bit less. I worked part time for a while, and I was to build the team over time, and people from the team took over, and they were really good people. And I think I wanted another challenge of development, and. It just happened and the client started applied technologies just then. We wanted to show that we did something other than Formula One. So I think we should be doing this. And I was thinking, well, I'm not sure that it's going to bring us any money, Carolyn. I know it's not going to bring us money, but it's something that we can talk about. And it will be fun. So I've managed to, uh, to convince um, the senior execs at the time. And we worked with cycling, sailing, canoeing, and rowing. But cycling mainly. And that was and they knew that they wanted to be more data focused and the data that they could collect till then was too sparse so if you buy a little bicycle computer and you go cycling for you know five hours it will tell you roughly your average speed and so on it gives you hardly to it as a result of this because we felt connected to a certain point so it was a hugely fun project and everyone who worked on it and McLaren loved it this is still with McLaren, but after 20 years, as I, as I said in the introduction, after 20 years... We'll see, it's just a matter of time that we will develop better and better understanding of models. And models for, say, how the body processes glucose, so people with diabetes, maybe get a better understanding and so that we can control our so, own... So, so you're, we're moving away from sort of some general diagnosis about a condition to real personalized medicine, yes. telling, telling a person, if you do this, this will happen. That's this is how you should change your lifestyle, for example. Absolutely. At the moment, you know, it's baby steps in this, but it's absolutely a direction that we want to get into. There's many things that are, you know, because there are aspects of it we can do now, but when will it be really powerful? I don't know, but I think the advances in AI at the moment are so rapid. It's unbelievably good. I, I know a lot of people fear it as well, but in, in the world of healthcare, I think we should embrace it because it really has a chance. A doctor plus AI together is going to be always much better than a doctor on their own. And that's the aim. It, it can only be better. I, I have no doubt about that. In managing the eth ethics of everything yes, else. I mean, is, we need another <laughs> hour to discuss <laughs> this. <laughs> up a whole new... But listen, Carolyn Hargrove, I guess this is almost like a second career for you. In the meantime, thank you very much for sharing your life scientific. Thank you.